While Princesses Sleep Princesses of Chadwick Castle Adventure Book One Emma Wright Illustrations by Assorted Artists Whose Works Have Entered the Public Domain To them the world owes a thank you. To the one true artist, thank you for not making the world just shades of grey. Dedication To every girl who believes she can be a princess. Copyright 2014 by Emma Wright All rights reserved. No part of this publication may be reproduced, distributed or transmitted. For permission requests, write to Wright House Books, Belmont, California www.emmawright.com Publisher's Note This is a work of fiction. Names, characters, places and incidents are a product of the author's imagination. Locales and public names are sometimes used for atmospheric purposes. Any resemblance to actual people, living or dead, or to businesses, companies, events, institutions or locales is completely coincidental. I thought it was going to be an ordinary day here at the castle. The weather on the moors was wet, with the rain pelting down, and our rooms were cold, as usual. My sister, Belle, and I were never allowed to play noisy games inside the castle. The whole morning we had been painting and reading and practising our musical instruments, and now we had nothing to do but daydream. I find myself twirling my ringlets and staring into the crackling fire. Princess Earl! Please use your kerchief to wipe your eyes. I kept my head still and reached for the lacy fabric hidden in my gown. Today I had on the blue brocade. I've been told the shade matched the colour of my eyes and made my hair look even blonder. Since Miss Stencil had gone back to her book, I just held on to the kerchief and continued to stare unblinking. Hey, Ella, Belle, my little sister, said. She shoved my shoulder and I turned to gaze into her green eyes. Even though she was ten, she was strong. I blinked the tears away. What? She'd ruined my contest. Why are you crying? Belle asked. I'm not. I was trying to see how long I could hold my eyelids open without blinking. And first, Miss Stencil, now Belle, had interrupted me just when I thought I'd beat my personal best time. Ninety-two seconds without a blink. I stuck my tongue out at her. Not that I didn't have cause to cry. I had heard something in passing earlier today that had upset me, perhaps enough to make most girls shed tears. But I didn't. When I went to the kitchen to visit Cook, some of the servants had whispered something about Mother spending too much, and something else I couldn't quite make out. Cook had caught me eavesdropping, You'd better keep quiet today, my little princess. Your royal mother has many things to consider and it wouldn't do for you to get in the way. My sister prodded my shoulder again. You're not very nice today, Belle said. I'm not going to tell you the secret because you're nasty to me. She clawed the air as if she were a cat and screeched. Sheesh! Even the four kittens sprawled at the bottom of my bed, jerked out of their sleep. They scurried to their mother, who was licking herself near the fireplace. So the secret is that you've metamorphosized into a feline? Meta what? She gave me that confused look. Metamorphose means change. Never mind. Can I get back to staring into the fire? It would keep my mind off the rumours about mother. Some mornings we, the princesses of Chadwick Castle, were allowed to get out and wander in the garden for some sunshine with our governess, Madame Lavella. But not today, thanks to the heavy fog and the frost. Might catch a cold, our governess had warned us when we asked. So here I am, blinking at the fire. If you don't want to hear the secret, then I shall leave you to stare into the fireplace, Belle scoffed. She swivelled on her heels and turned away. Of course, I could barely see her heels since they were hidden under layers of soft chiffon. She skipped towards the open doorway that led to the main corridor. Wait! Could she have heard the same commotion I had last night? Belle and I generally slept in separate rooms. She with her lady-in-waiting, Miss Glotty, sleeping in a bed near hers. 
Miss Stencil's bed was placed a few feet away from mine. Last night I was awoken by scuffling outside my bedroom. I almost went to peek at the gap under the door, but I was too cold, in only my white chemise, to step onto the red terracotta stone floor. Still, I'd heard it. Tell me, I demanded. Say please, my bratty sister said. Please, happy? She grabbed our cat, Mr Grey, in her arms and shot a sly glance at Miss Stencil. Belle's eyes looked wild, and for the first time I noticed her cheeks were flushed pink. What is it? I asked as she ambled toward me. Strange things have been happening, she whispered. First, there were noises outside my bedroom last night, so I went to peek under the door. Miss Clotty didn't stop you? Miss Clotty helped Belle dress up and dress down each day, and made sure Belle practised her pianoforte and voice exercises. Of course, she reported to our mother, the Queen, when Belle didn't finish her assignments. Miss Clotty wasn't in my room. That's why I went to the door when the noises woke me up. It was late, about midnight, I think. Miss Clotty not being in the bedroom raised a red flag in my head. If she hadn't been performing her duty, where had she been? Also, midnight was close to the time I'd heard the hurried footsteps outside my bedroom. The doors in our castle were made of solid acacia, and according to my governess, who seemed to know all the history in the world, the acacia wood was transported here all the way from the hills of Italy during the 15th century. It was at least six inches thick and had carvings on both sides. Such a solid build would not allow the slightest sound to get through, except there was a wide gap at the bottom. In fact, so wide was the opening that I could easily insert my entire hand, palm down on the floor, all the way out. What did you hear? What did you see? Shoes clattering, Belle replied. People wearing them and clopping past as if they were horses. The people didn't speak, but I believe they were all women, as if they were hurrying. What about their clothes? What did they have on? If they were mother's friends, they'd wear satin gowns with ruffles and lace, and if they were part of the working group, their clothes would be cotton and linen with fewer frills, clothes they could wear and still sweat in comfortably. We had been studying the artist Auguste Renoir, who loved to capture everyday people from working-class families. I always marvelled at the types of outfits people wore. Clothes could tell us who the visitors were. I only saw shoes. I couldn't tell what else they were wearing. Fine, what sort of fabric swept on the floor as they passed? Have you not been listening? Only their shoes. I think they were pink, and they walked unnaturally. Pink shoes? My hand went up to my lips involuntarily. How could she not have seen the clothes at all? All the dresses we wore draped to the ground. Pink and heavily beaded with pearls and diamonds. Belle shook my arm. Tonight. Maybe we can find out tonight. Let's beg Miss Clotty to let us sleep together tonight in my room. If Miss Clotty wasn't in Belle's bedroom last night, she could be aware of what was happening while we lay sleeping. She could even be party to it. I dared not ask our mother because some things we children were not allowed to know. It was better not to question. We could find out for ourselves by asking our ladies-in-waiting or our governess, or even cook. But since we were not supposed to be up at midnight asking about pink shoes, it could get us into a bind. I'll tell her I was afraid last night. Good idea, I said. Perhaps Miss Clotty would rather not leave Belle alone and might welcome this suggestion. But we must make sure Mother doesn't find out. I heard she was upset this morning. My sister's eyes grew rounder. Her grey pupils widened as if she were afraid. Is it father? I shrugged. Maybe. I thought about what Cook had said about mother overspending and acting secretive. Was the tension in the castle related to the noises and the clopping shoes? Who were these women? New ladies-in-waiting for my mother. Or new ladies-in-waiting for us. And what were they doing? walking along our hallway in the middle of the night. 
Even though Belle was two years younger, we studied together. But I was tall for twelve, and stood a good head taller than Belle. Sometimes we quibbled, but most days it was fun to be with my sister, and we have shared many adventures. Tonight promised to be one of them. That evening, we couldn't wait for tea time at six. This was the biggest meal in our day. Our mother did not take tea with us except for grand occasions. Most afternoons we ate a simple meal with our governess and ladies-in-waiting. It wasn't anything special, but the food was satisfying. For tea that day, the servers placed platters of chicken with potatoes baked with rosemary before us. A side dish of caramel carrots and creamed spinach came in two silver tureens, polished so bright our faces reflected on the sides of the server. Tom passed us a serving. And of course, there was fruit. But throughout the meal, my mind was focused on the right time to ask Miss Clotty about our sleeping arrangements. If she agreed, then Miss Stencil would have to say yes, since they were best friends. Now was as good as any. I don't see any harm to it, she answered, a finger poised on her cheek. What do you think, Jane? Miss Clotty asked Miss Stencil. Jane was Miss Stencil's first name. We were never allowed to call any of the adults by their first names, even though we were princesses. It was a rule of the castle. We must show respect no matter what. As long as they stay quiet, Miss Stencil said. She smiled and spooned another bite of the dessert into her mouth. Tom served creme brulee and peach cutlets baked into its top that night. It was one of Cook's specialities and my favourite. And of course, we washed it all down with chamomile tea, which is supposed to have a soothing effect. I hoped it wouldn't make me woozy. I rushed back to my bedroom, and after I brushed my own hair, Miss Stencil dressed me into my white nightgown. I draped my blue and gold quilted robe onto my shoulders, and waited with Miss Stencil for Belle to come over to spend the night. The wait was making my heart race. What if Miss Clotty changed her mind, and Belle couldn't have a sleepover with me? When the clock in my bedroom struck eight, Belle waltzed in, with her favourite pillow hugged to her chest. She had a flair for dramatics. I also could sense she was excited about our venture later. The tricky part would be to make sure that Miss Stencil stayed asleep. Belle, too, was dressed with her quilted overcoat wrapped around her thin shoulders and with her white nightgown beneath it. The corridors and hallways went bitterly cold even in the spring, and we'd just left the frosty winter three days ago. We were thankful to slip between the heavy, goose-town coverlets on the bed. The roaring fireplace kept ablaze throughout the night gave little comfort, since the high ceiling sucked up all the warm air to the very top. Most nights, my four-poster bed felt like it could very well have been placed in the open moor. Belle and I fluffed up the six pillows on my bed, and we made as if we were going to sleep. Don't forget to say your prayers, Miss Stencil reminded us without looking up from her station on the armchair by the fireplace, her nose in a large book. Reading by the light of candles and flickering fire posed much challenge, but she seemed undaunted. Sure, I yelled back. No need to speak so loudly. It's unbecoming of a girl, let alone a princess, she said. She shook her head. Belle nudged me in the ribs. Do you think she'll fall asleep soon? She never sleeps in the armchair. She'll wait till I doze off. Then she'll mark her book, stoke the fire some, and climb into her bed, I whispered. I jerked my chin slightly toward the single bed on the right of mine. Let's snuggle under the covers. It's warmer. What if we really fall into a deep sleep? I asked. Seemed like a reasonable question. You want to be on the first watch? Then when you feel your eyes drooping, you can shake me awake. We can take turns. Good idea. So as Belle wafted into dreamland, I kept my eyes hidden under the goose down, wide open and lay as still as stone. The wind-up clock that Horace, our mechanical engineer, invented, 
the very first in the kingdom, I was told, ticked loudly. I never noticed its tick-tocks before. Perhaps I always fell asleep when there were still little sounds of pattering outside the door, or rustling of the pages Miss Stencil made as she leafed through her book. Stay awake, I told myself, and pinched my arm a few times. I must have dozed off, because I was awoken by the shuffling sounds I'd heard last night. Miss Stencil snored softly, and even Belle was fast asleep. But something had disturbed my sleep, and it was not the crackling of the fire or the wood popping in the fireplace. I sat up and briefly noticed a faint light under the door. People were walking right by our doors again. I glanced at the clock. Midnight! Like clockwork, as they say. Quietly, I shook Belle's arm. She moved and tried to swat me, as if I were a fly. Belle, wake up, I whispered in her ear. Her eyes fluttered. Then she sat up as if I'd slapped her cheeks. What? she said too loudly. Shh! I clamped her mouth with my hand. She must have remembered where she was and the mission we were on since she nodded as if saying sorry. We slipped off the bed noiselessly. In the dim room, we searched for our slippers. The freezing floor felt like frosty needles jabbing the soles of our feet. In the corner, on her single bed, Miss Stencil stirred and pulled the down blankets over her face. We both cast a glance at her sleeping form. Belle and I tiptoed to the door and knelt on the cold floor. I bent over and pressed my cheek to the bottom gap of the door. We had taken too long and only glimpsed the last pair of feet crossing the span of our doorway. The feet were small, no larger than two inches wide. But these couldn't be children because someone giggled and it sounded like grown women. I even heard Mother's voice. She must have been at the front of the line, and I had missed her shoes. It was too dim to see much, but at least we had confirmed that both Belle and I had not dreamed up the clopping noise in shoes. Something was happening. I strained my eyes to witness the last pink shoes clip-clopping down the hallway. These were no ordinary footwear. Several empty rooms were situated to the left of Belle's bedroom. No one had slept in them for years. Were these strange guests going in there? Was this supposed to be a secret? But before Belle and I opened the door so we could take a peek, a cold hand clutched my shoulder and squeezed tightly. What do you princesses think you are doing awake and peeping down there on the floor at midnight? You'll catch your death. Miss Stencil had caught us. But my mind was on Mother. What was she up to? I had a strong suspicion that the visitors with their tottering pink shoes were responsible for some of the hush-hush talk I had overheard. But, instead of getting answers, I only found more questions. Was the mystery of the shoes related to Mother's overspending and the rumours how could we find the truth and help Mother? While Princesses Sleep, Book One The Mystery and Adventure Continues in Princesses of Chadwick Castle Adventures, Book Two Beaded Dresses Mystery Check out Book Two and other Emirate book series on Amazon.